I'm excited to be giving a talk today on population flows. What I mean by flows is how many people we have on the planet per period and the speed of history, uh, which will become clear hopefully as I get through more of the talk here. Uh, and my interest and our interest uh, at UT Austin on population um, follows a bit from this motivation here, which is that enduring low fertility uh, may characterize the coming centuries. I'm not going to spend too much time defending this. This is just a motivating point. Um, it seems to be a deep fact that when we improve life opportunities, when we make it um, easier to do lots of cool and interesting things with our lives, um, people choose relatively fewer children than they otherwise would. Uh, and if that is a deep fact about the world, we might think that population decline could be enduring, um, which is the, the premise I'll somewhat work from today as, as a motivating starting point. Furthermore, recent work has suggested that this might be a threat to long-term human welfare for a couple of reasons. Uh, so Chad Jones has perhaps one of the most well-known papers on this. Um, in 2022, showing that economic growth ends entirely under a regime of population decline. So even if you weren't totalist, presumably, um, meaning you don't care about the total number of people who ever live, if it's true that economic growth ends under a declining population, this could just matter for per capita well-being um, in a way that's first order uh, important. And then in Will's book, he has kind of a, a follow-up or related worry about stagnation leading to a prolonged period of high existential risk. So the idea here is, you know, maybe we want to have small populations indefinitely, but if we had a few centuries of very small populations and this slowed down economic growth, then we might be stuck in a period with really high um, existential risk for long enough that we just might not make it through there. Uh, and then some of my colleagues, Mike Jerusalem and Dean Spears, um, they have a bit of a separate worry that humanity just might become very, very small, which would, um, you know, just mean we get a small bit of value each period, um, and we may even be vulnerable to risks that wouldn't otherwise be vulnerable if we had a larger and more uh, robust population. So this is kind of a confluence of worries um, about population decline as potentially being a global priority. And to summarize it, you might think there will be fewer people and or these people will have worse lives. Um, that's kind of the, the a priori case for thinking this might be um, a big issue. Okay, so what this paper is going to do is um, poke at this stagnation concern a bit uh, and, and ask about its normative force, its normative legitimacy here. So this is going to be uh, just to to prime an intuition that I'm going to explore in more detail as we go on. Um, but let's think about a, a quick counterpoint to this quality of life concern. Um, imagine we could counterfactually have somehow increased the population in the year 1300 to speed up economic growth a little bit. Uh, that also means relatively more people would have had to exist in 1300, um, which we think like had worse living standards than we have today, uh, almost certainly. And so there's, there's something perverse about increasing the number of people in these technologically immature states in order to bring about um, an increase in economic growth. Uh, and this is going to be the sort of thing that I'm digging into a bit more throughout this talk. Uh, and what I'll show you is that uh, a way to think about this first order concern about population is that it's going to govern what I call the speed of history. Uh, yeah, Andre. It doesn't have to. This, again, take that first slide as just kind of priming um, one reason you might think that there's a countervailing force, and then we'll, we'll, we'll dig into this. Great. Okay. So, so what do I mean by speeding up history here? Okay. What I'm going to show you is that if we take results from standard models about what causes long-run economic growth, um, it's going to imply that the size of the population is going to increase at the same rate as you've increased uh, the rate of technological progress. And so if we think of this on a timeline in some sense, we're bringing forward people and technologies at the same rate. And so if we want to do some sort of comparison of person-by-person well-being, nobody's made better off. Okay, so imagine we, we crunch everybody in a bit earlier, but we crunch all the technology in a bit earlier, and nobody's been uh, made better off there. Okay, so 
I'm going to use this you know, somewhat new framing on this model to sort out concerns about population decline. Um, and what's going to turn out to be the case is that how the model ends is going to be uh, a key issue that I don't think has been recognized prior uh, in this literature, although Toby is a paper where he does something quite similar in a general class of interventions you might consider. Um, and this comes back to your, your question, Andrea, about, you know, whether it changes the relative or the absolute number is going to depend on, like, what's constraining the total number of people ever. Okay, so let me, uh, I'll come back to this a couple of times throughout the talk. Um, but what I mean by how the model ends is essentially how humanity goes extinct or how value stops being produced. Okay, so imagine a case where an asteroid is going to come in a thousand years uh, that destroys the planet. When we use this framing or this intuition that what we're doing is speeding up history, if we increase the population size, this is in some sense clearly going to have some value, right? If we think uh, the, the limit on value is going to be some temporal thing, so in a thousand years it all ends no matter what, then speeding up history is going to be valuable because we just crunch more of our potential history in before this happens. On the other hand, if you think existential risk is fully endogenous in the extreme case, um, presumably, that's going to be brought forward at the same rate as population and technology is brought forward. Um, so if you think, you know, one day when technology gets high enough, we've invented AGI, everybody dies. Well, if what we're doing with population sizes is bringing forward people and the development of AGI, then actually the impact of the size of the population today is to not increase the total timeless population at all. Um, and in fact, it becomes completely neutral, even under a totalist framing. Okay, so in some sense, the takeaway of this talk, um, it's not going to be an overall claim about whether or not it's good to have larger populations. It's going to be to explore this speed of history framing and to show um, it's in some sense greedy. So I was starting to look at it in the sense that it might neutralize this stagnation concern, and it turns out that it even starts to eat away at some of the totalist value, depending on your assumptions about exogenous versus endogenous um, end of histories. Okay, so the roadmap for this talk, I'm going to start with an extremely simple demonstration to draw all of this out. So we'll have constant populations um, and two levels of technology. We'll just think like there's an immature technological state, and then one day after enough um, progress, we transition to a technologically mature state. And after fleshing all of this out in the simplest possible way, I'll convince you that if you went to something that looks, looks a bit more realistic and continuous, um, everything's just going to pass right through, which gives us a bit of a new reading of standard semi-endogenous growth style models. Uh, and then to conclude, um, if I have some time, um, I'll give you some speculative sci-fi considerations to think about. Um, and this isn't just because this is GPI, and I know that y'all uh, get a kick out of these. Um, but this is because it turns out to be necessary. If what, if what population size is doing is speeding up history, then what matters for the value of that sort of intervention would be what's happening at the end. Like, what are we getting more of? Um, so in order to assess, you know, the goodness of having a larger population in 2025, we have to make guesses about um, what's going to be happening thousands of years from now, potentially. Okay, so let's go through this discrete endogenous growth setting. Um, so for some of you, this will be very familiar, so I'm only going to cover it in uh, this one to two bullets here. Um, for some of you, this might be new. But growth theory... Um, by way of Paul Romer's contributions and Chad Jones's, uh, implies that research effort determines the level of innovation in a period, so aggregate research effort. Uh, and what this means is that if we have a larger population, and let's like hold fixed professions just to um, fix intuitions here, if we hold fixed the composition of the population and we just scale it up, we should expect more aggregate ideas to be produced. We'll come up with more good ideas of how to solve problems, right? And Knowledge and ideas are this special thing where if we create more of them, they're not watered down by more of us being around, and so this gives us a reason to think per capita values will increase. Um, so this is a bit unique, and it gives rise to increasing returns to scale, a larger population um, being more efficient. Okay, so I'm going to just quickly 
moved by that for now um, and turn our attention to uh, a model that just takes this as given. So we'll consider a world here with two possible levels of technology. Um, you'll either have low living standards in state L or high living standards in state H, and it's going to be you know, deterministic. This isn't some sort of random process about jumping between them. It's just once we have um, figured out how we can industrialize or whatever you want to think of this transition as, um, everybody lives in that state forever afterwards. Okay, so these Romer-Jones models, and I'll show you this more formally um, later in the talk, but you can just take it uh, on faith now, that these models imply that we transition from state L to state H once there's been a sufficient number of cumulative people years. Okay, so what matters is how many years of total thinking has there been in some sense. Um, so you might think this comes from an underlying mechanism where we need a collection of sub-inventions. So it might just be, we need to do lots of things before we invent steam power, which helps us get to industrialization. Um, and we'll just hit all of these sub-inventions faster if there are more people on the planet in any given period. Um, more crudely, you could just think, you know, we're waiting on extremely smart people to help push things forward in, in fits and starts, and these geniuses arrive with random probability, um, and so if you just increase the pool of people, you're more likely to have one in any, any given period. Okay, I'm not going to take a stance on exactly what causes this, um, but in increasing the aggregate number of people seems like it should lead to an increase in the uh, total number of ideas, which would lead to progress, etc. Okay, so for concreteness, because we'll walk through some nice round numerical examples here, um, let's just say it takes 100,000 people years, okay? All right, so in this setting, this very, very simple setting, um, suppose we had a benevolent planner who could pick the population size, okay? So they can just, out of thin air, pick an N, and then we have a constant population from then on out. And the question that I'm going to be getting at here is whether or not you should pick a population that's larger because it's going to speed up progress. This is the, the standard implication that people draw from this line of work, um, that because knowledge is non-rival and shared among everybody, then a larger population um, is good for this reason. So that's what I'm going to uh, uh, try to draw out here. Okay. So let's focus on a simple case. We're either going to pick n equals 100, again, forget about units, uh, or n equals 500, which based on this assumption here at the bottom that it's going to take 100,000 people years to get us to this point, it's either going to take, uh, sorry, 100,000 people years, which means it takes 1,000 chronological years if we have n equal to 100, or 200 years if we have n equal to 500. Okay, so we are speeding up progress in the standard way. And the question is, is it better to get there faster? Okay, so I've already given you a flavor of where this argument's going to go. But if you take the perspective of any given individual, the answer is actually no. Um, so to, to flesh this out, again, let's try to formalize it. Individuals can be identified by their order of birth. Okay, so um, I is going to point out when you were born in the history of humanity in terms of um, your order your order of birth. And just again for simplicity, we'll assume they lived for one period. Um, okay, so I equals five is going to be the fifth person ever born. And unless we're in a very strange, very, very tiny population, they're likely going to share the planet with their, um, their friends I equal four, I equal six. Okay, so this is um, just giving you an idea of how I'm labeling people here. And because we've stipulated it's going to take 100,000 of these people years to get to H, the first I less than or equal to 100,000, they're not going to care that you've sped up economic progress in this way. It's no good for them. They um, are going to live in the low technological state no matter what. Um, and yes, they're going to have more contemporaries. I'll set that aside as a second order issue that I'm not going to make much headway on in this talk. Um, but there are environmental things you might be worried about, et cetera. Um, that's, that's for a different project. Um, okay. So if it's true that people, uh, I less than or equal to a hundred thousand don't care, maybe people I greater than or equal to a hundred thousand people, a uh, hundred thousand do care. Okay. Um, well, this is where we're going to get into some complications, but we'll suppose for the moment that these people exist with certainty. Okay. So no matter what, 
person number 100,001 is going to come into existence. Okay, well, she's going to live in the high technological state, no matter what. So she's going to get high living standards. And the only thing that's on the line for her is when she comes into existence. So if we have larger populations, this all happens earlier in time. If we have small populations, this all happens later in time. Um, I'm going to take that to be normatively irrelevant. Uh, it doesn't matter to me that the calendar reads 2023 rather than 2523 uh, right now. Okay, so the result of this line of thinking is that any individual who comes into existence with certainty is going to be, ma be made no better off by increasing population sizes. And this is going to give us some reason to doubt this um, per capita well-being effect that's very frequently associated with population sizes. All right, let's do this graphically, um, because I'll show you a couple of graphs that look like this uh, throughout the talk. Um, OK, so in the top panel here, we have the population size in a given period, the flow population, I call it. Um, so the population in a given period, I've claimed, or I've just stipulated that we're choosing between constant populations. So this 100 here is just a size of 100 um, on the planet at any given time. In our actual world, if you went to our world in data, you'd see we were very, very small for a long time, and now there's lots of people on the planet. This is the analog to that for just a simple constant population case. In the bottom panel, we have the living standards in a given period. So this too would be analogous to just pulling up the R world in data for per capita incomes, let's say, and you know, in our actual world, it follows a, it's very low for a long time, and then it shoots up. Here, we just have uh, a flat, um, low level of living standard, and then we can jump up to a high uh, living standard. And with this population of 100, this happens in year 1000. That's when we get to 100,000 people years. Okay, so what happens if we make the population larger? Well, on the population graph, that should be easy. It's just going to shift up. And on the living standards graph, um, what's happening is we spend less time in this state of, of um, low living standards and more time in the state of high living standards. Uh, and so this is exactly the result that you would expect and that I've explained verbally, but we're just, we're just tracing it out now. Um, but we care about living standards for people, not for time periods. And so maybe what we can do is eliminate time from these axes and just graph um, living standards for people, and that might be more informative. So let's go ahead and do that here. So the x-axis in this plot is no longer time, which is how we're used to thinking about things. It's people lined up by the order of their birth. Okay, so i equals 1 is all the way at the beginning here. They're the first human ever uh, uh, to have, I don't know, evolved or been born, whatever happens at the beginning. Um, and I've labeled here 100,000, or, oh yeah, each person in this simple, silly example just lives for one time period. So uh, once we get to person 100,000, um, we get this improvement in living standards. Uh, and as I've described to you already, it turns out if you have a larger population, this plot looks identical. It exactly overlays it. So the thing that's changing is time, but time isn't on these axes uh, because it doesn't seem independently important. Okay, so this is the result I'm gonna state maybe five or six more times uh, before you're sick of me. Uh, but being in a larger world population with faster technological progress hasn't made anybody's life better off in this case. Okay, so a corollary to this, the fact that no individual's life is better off if they come into existence with certainty, is that if we have a predetermined number of people who will ever live, so imagine the planner's problem is, I don't know, picking some fixed number of souls and putting them on the planet at any given period. Um, then population size in a given period is going to be normatively irrelevant. Everybody's life is going to be exactly how it otherwise would have been, um, even if we accept this premise that technological progress just spread, is sped up. Okay, but I recognize this predetermined number of people condition um, is unrealistic relative to how actual facts of the world uh, seem to exist. But what this is making clear is that it's going to have to be something about the number of existences that matter, right? It's, it's, it can't come from the fact that just, you know, holding fixed the number of people, we're going to make everybody's life better off. Um, if we hold fixed the number of individuals, 
then it's going to be normatively irrelevant. And so something must be happening to the number of existences that can change total value here. Okay? And what this means is we're going to have to think a little bit about existential risks. Okay, so let's take case one, which, if you've been following along, uh, should lead to a pretty clear and straightforward conclusion. Uh, in this model, if we have an asteroid that's going to kill everybody in the year 500 um, or any other year, or there's some exogenous probability, the point is that it has nothing to do with uh, technological progress or, or the number of people on the planet. Then we get this trivial solution. Both total and average utility end up increasing in the size of the flow population and average here because we get more people in the good state, not because we've made any individual's life better off. Um, so that's not going to be contradictory. So for n equals 100, we're getting the first 50,000 life years, if year 500 is the capital T where everything ends. Uh, for n equals 500, we're getting the first 250,000 life years. Uh, and that's going to be the only difference. So let's go ahead and put this on our uh, plot. That helps us think through these issues. Um, for anybody keeping score at home, um, this should actually only go halfway, and it goes a bit further than halfway, but, but let's just take the qualitative point that it's not quite there. Uh, so if we're only getting the first 50,000 life years when we have a small population, they never even make it to the, the technologically mature state. They're wiped out uh, before that ever happens, and that's the number of people who've ever lived. And what happens if the population's larger? Well, they're moving faster, and so they've gotten further along this shared potential history by the time this asteroid has come. Now, uh, in a richer model, we might think, well, actually, the chances of surviving such an event also increase with the amount of technological progress we've had to that point. Um, let's ignore that for now. That would be a, a more detailed and complicated case. Now, let's just take it as given that there's some exogenous cap T when everything ends. Okay, but let's look at case two with um, endogenous extinction. So let's think through two versions of this that would look a little bit different mathematically, um, but it's all going to be verbal here. Uh, okay, so case one is that we just invent something that leads to our extinction. Uh, and this would be something like the artificial general intelligence ca case that people are worried about. Uh, and so here, let's just say, turns out that the only way to get to state H comes with inventing this risky technology, and in fact, that risky technology ends up killing everybody soon after it's invented. Okay, so once we make the jump uh, to this high living standard state, we're all wiped out immediately. Another thing you might imagine is we invent something that makes it possible for a rogue individual or a rogue small group to end humanity. Um, so maybe in state H, uh, it's very easy to manufacture bioweapons for any given individual. Uh, and now you might think we face something like, um, you know, a one in some chance of drawing an individual that would have the motivations to, to wipe everybody out. Well, in each of these cases, then it, it will in fact be true that the number of individuals who ever live is invariant to the size of the population in a given period. Um, so the AGI case is going to be really simple because we've already seen that it just takes some number of people years to get there. Um, and so if we're speeding up history, we're just punching that forward. Um, in the bioweapons example, you know, in expectation, we have 100,000 more people we can draw before we get somebody um, with these sorts of motivations. Yeah, Joe. It doesn't come in here in this, yeah. Throughout the talk, I'll, I'll only briefly touch on this in, in a similar way I did to this asteroid case that you might also think that, like, surviving an asteroid is going to be endogenously changed by how far along we are in, like, technological history in some sense. Um, so these sorts of things will make this model much more complicated. Um, so I'll table it for now. But, yeah, no, this is also uh, a good point. Okay. And so... Okay, and the key takeaway here is that with endogenous extinction, we're going to be bringing forward extinction at the same rate we bring forward everything else. The size of the flow population um, is normatively irrelevant. And we can do this on this same graph here. Um, so this is uh, more like 
seeing any case of bioweapons that we get to uh, a high level of technological progress. And then we can draw some fixed number of people in expectation until something bad happens. Uh, and here, it is the case that we exactly overlay uh, the two populations on, on this graph, which I take to be the normatively relevant graph. Okay, so what do we do with this? Well, in expectation, both channels seem like they're gonna matter from our position of uncertainty today. Um, and in the endogenous case, this fully endogenous case, well, we're gonna be indifferent to the population size. In the exogenous case, the larger population is better. And so in some sense, um, we could say, well, you know, this looks a bit like the exogenous case if I could just costlessly pick two different populations, the larger one would still be um, the beneficial one. That's punting a little bit because the whole idea of global priorities research is to prioritize, not just to um, give us a sense of like, would this be valuable? It's, is this among one of the most valuable things I could be doing? Um, and here, it's gonna be the case that the, the value of speeding up history is decreasing in the share of um, risk that's endogenous, which should influence priorities. And so I think I meant to put this on the slide, it may not have, um, but you can evaluate the benefit of having an extra one person in any given period um, by something like the probability you think we go extinct via exogenous causes times the value that would be generated by one additional person at the very end before this happens. Um, but in any case, it's just clear that it's, it's decreasing in the share of risk that's endogenous because if it's fully endogenous in the way that I've described, then there is just no value in uh, increasing the size of the population. Great, okay. Um, now I'm gonna spend a few minutes um, convincing you that this isn't just an artifact of some very, very simple setting I've shown up. In fact, um, this arises in the standard models that people use to think through the relationships between population and economic growth. And in particular, um, the semi-endogenous growth model is the most standard, um, but even regular endogenous growth models are just special cases of this anyway, so this would uh, sit there as well. And the notation here, A is gonna be the level of technology, but it's continuous now. Okay, so A dot is the change. A dot over A is the percent change. So if we say something like there was a 1% increase in productivity this year, that would be A dot over A is 1%. Um, this N is the size of the population. So we would expect that the, the size of the population could increase the rate of technological progress doesn't have to be linear. I'm gonna do everything in the linear case here because it gets a lot more complicated. And, and, and the results do change if you, if you leave the linearity world in ways that I think are um, complicated and nuanced that I'm not gonna talk much about today. Um, and then you don't have to have this term, but A is a feedback loop. Uh, it could be positive or negative, but it seems to be negative such that as we make more progress technologically, it becomes harder to continue making progress. This is gonna have no bearings on uh, what I say here. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna set lambda equal to one. If you want some intuition, I was talking with some folks um, over coffee this morning uh, about this. Uh, lambda is governing the shape of how the population, of how increases in population increase the rate of TFP. So, Lambda less than one would give us something like diminishing returns to population. Uh, and typically what motivates this sort of thought that we might have diminishing returns is that perhaps we have to make sequential discoveries. So we have to discover one thing before we discover the next. And so therefore it's not clear that having everybody in the same time period is gonna lead to the same amount of progress as spreading people out. Um, likewise, we avoid duplication effects. So we couldn't accidentally be working on the same problem if if like I followed you in history and could just read everything that you thought about during your life. Um, lambda greater than one could be motivated by something like collaboration effects. Uh, so we might be more productive because we can all gather in this room, whereas if we lived one after the other, we just have to read each other's you know, notes or publish things and not be able to ask them questions, which I think plausibly makes it harder to make progress. Um, in limits, I think neither of these is plausible. It's gonna be some sort of complicated curve. So I'm just gonna take a, a lambda equals one as a, a reasonable approximation.
Okay, so this function here describes the rate of change of uh, our level of innovation. And so we can integrate that with respect to time to get the level of innovation in any given period. And it turns out to rely on some constants and then this integral here, which is the, the cumulative amount of people years that have happened before date t, okay? Uh, and so nothing I said before is gonna rely on constant populations or anything like this. Could be an arbitrary path of populations. What's mattering is the interval, the total number of people years that have happened by some date. And that's gonna pin down uh, the level of technology. And so everything from the simple model is the same. By the time, if we identify a person as person I, when they come into existence, um, by the time they come into existence, the level of technology is invariant to when they live. It just matters what the path of population was beforehand. Uh, now, this is all along the population margin, I should say. And so you might be thinking to yourself, well, one thing that could change, uh, the level of TFT they experienced during their life is whether or not we spent a larger share of resources on research. That's true. All I'm doing is, is thinking about the margin of changing population sizes. Okay, so let's do slightly more realistic versions of these graphs I showed you before. So imagine we're starting today and we're, we're facing the prospect of enduring population decline. Um, so that orange curve, maybe you would think of this as, as um, a concerning potential baseline that we just have decaying populations. Uh, and alternatively, we might imagine the population could stabilize at its current level. Okay, well, what this model tells us is uh, we would expect the stabilized population to have higher levels of TFT in any given period for exactly the reasons I've been um, harping on for the past 30 minutes or so. Okay, but as I said earlier, we care about living standards for people, not time periods. So let's flip this graph again, and we just get a continuous version of the thing I showed you earlier, where the x-axis is cumulative people years, the y-axis is um, the TFP experienced by each of those individuals. And if we overlay the stabilized population against the depopulating world, you're gonna guess what this looks like correctly. So it's the exact same thing. Okay, so avoiding depopulation and stabilizing the population also hasn't made anybody's life better in per capita terms. Okay, so now that we move to this slightly more fleshed out case, um, we can go back and think a bit about the concerns that I raised on the earlier slide. So two of them, well, they're all somewhat related. Will McCaskill's concern is building off of the, the Chad Jones concern. So um, what this slide will show you is it turns out that the Jones 2022 concern is in some sense equivalent to the concern that uh, Jerusalem and Spears have. Um, and I'll remind you about those here. So Jones is worried that economic growth just ends entirely under population decline. Uh, and Jerusalem and Spears seem to distinctly worry that negative population growth could lead to a situation where humanity just peters out. And that's the thing to worry about. Okay, so... Let's take a look at this Jones model in a bit more detail. Um, so for tractability and analytical purposes, uh, the, the case in that model is constant population growth rates, um, at least in the baseline early versions of this. Uh, and he's studying depopulation with a constant rate of depopulating versus exponential growth with a positive rate of, of growth here. And so what's happening here is that if you take negative exponential growth and just run it forward, you get a finite number of cumulative people years. And so this result is perfectly consistent, not surprisingly, with what I've shown you, which the only difference is that um, the way that that model is closed is that negative exponential population growth just leads to zero people in some sense voluntarily. So there's a voluntary extinction built into that. But if you were to compare them people by people, you would get the exact same result, that the first M people that ever exist in the depopulating world had the same quality of life. Um, so it turns out a, a, a bit of a rereading of this model gets us the result that even in these endogenous growth models, the reason that positive population growth or, or weakly positive population growth is good is because we never go extinct. We never end up with a planet of zero people producing zero ideas. So here's how that model looks if you want to read it through uh, this framing. Um, the 
empty planet equilibrium he talks about is one that just has a finite number of people who ever exist and the quote unquote expanding cosmos of positive growth that goes on forever is one where we follow further along this, this again, shared history. Okay, so we can go and layer on existential risk into these models as well in a bit of a more realistic and continuous way. Um, so I'm not gonna talk through these functional forms in detail, partly because uh, I made them up in a way that's probably not <laughs> rigorous. Um, but the key thing is in this top version of existential risk, we have a, a situation where um, A is quote unquote uh, risky. Um, so as A increases, the probability of survival is decreasing. The denominator of survival is, is increasing. Okay, so. Um, the important thing on the top equation here is that uh, A makes us less safe. So as we invent more things, we're drawing technologies that might kill us. Um, and existential risk is scaling with the size of the population. And that's coming from this idea that, you know, in many cases you might think of, we need technology and bad actors to result in, in our extinction. Um, if there are only 10 people on the planet, the chances that one of them wants to kill everybody is a lot smaller than if there's a million people on the planet, for example. Um, this bottom version has the same implication about populations, um, but it just stipulates that maybe uh, technology makes us safer. So as um, A increases, um, our probability of survival goes to one. Okay, uh, so let's just focus on each of these columns independently here. So in the left column is the case where A is dangerous. And again, these are our smaller and larger population worlds where orange is smaller and blue is larger. Um, so in the case where technological progress is dangerous, the period survival rate as the large population is discovering more things faster, um, it's falling faster. And if we look at the bottom graph, this is the cumulative survival probability for that population. So it's lower in any given period. Um, and in the right-hand column, we have a version where technology is safe. So as we invent more things, the probability we survive goes to one. And in fact, it goes to one fast enough that our long-run survival probability is positive in the limit. Um, okay, so this is kind of just a, a different assumption here. And this bottom left graph is telling us um, the cumulative survival probability for smaller and larger populations over time. Um, but as I've uh, already argued and shown you a whole bunch of times, um, what's going to happen if you do this by people uh, is that they exactly overlay each other. Um, and what's interesting about this finding um, is that in these simple and straightforward specifications, we can't use population growth to, in some sense, grow us to safety. Um, and this is in a sense, the conjecture um, of, or, or it's the findings of a paper by Leopold Aschenbrenner that's being revived and worked on by, by Phil Trammell as well, I believe, at this point. Um, and so this rule is, is completely different. He has an experiment in his paper where, where increasing the population size, where everything's endogenous, can, in fact, grow us to safety. Um, and to be honest, neither of us have been able to figure out the difference yet, so we're still working through that. Um, but this logic does make me a little bit suspicious that something's going on there that's going to be less intuitive than it seemed at first. That if everything's endogenous and what we're doing is bringing everything forward, it does seem to me that the simplest specifications are going to render um, the size of the population in a given period neutral. But I could be wrong about that, and I'm, you know, interested to figure out or, or for me and Phil and Leopold to figure this out. Okay, so before I wrap up, I'm gonna come back to some of these comments before that came up and say, I'm feeling confused still about what exactly we should be classifying as exogenous versus endogenous risk. Uh, and, and that's gonna greatly determine how you end up, you know, coming down on this issue. Um, this asteroid-like risk, it might have endogenous properties, right? If our survival chance is gonna be increasing if we're larger or more advanced, um, that's gonna be a distinct benefit that's not captured in anything I said here. Um, likewise, when I brought up bioweapons, um, Jeff raised this point that, you know, maybe if there are just many more people on the planet, the probability of a critical mass surviving some sort of um, biological event is higher. Uh, 
and that could matter, certainly. Uh, and I've said nothing about this here. Um, now, here's like a, a different and maybe even more speculative thing to be thinking about here. Um, if we're thinking about this endogenous extinction uh, where total timeless human value is going to be invariant to speeding things up in this way, that doesn't mean no other forms of value could persist. Um, so imagine what's going to happen after human humanity goes extinct, should that happen, is that some new intelligent life form that generates value will evolve on Earth. I mean, we're going to be thinking about extremely long runs here, and so maybe that will happen. Um, then this endogenous extinction thing isn't quite endogenous anymore, in the sense that imagine we crunch the human time scale down by a factor of 10. Um, we've, in some sense, left more time on the back end for everything else to happen. So we've held fixed the amount of value humanity will ever generate. We've brought everything forward. And now there's just, you know, more time on the planet for other things to happen. Um, whether that's going to have enough value to, to, in the end, shake out as a reasonable consideration is going to depend on, you know, yeah, what you think about how evolution is going to continue um, after we're gone, should we you know, leave the stage. Uh, so in any case, I have no firm conclusions. I remain very confused about all of this, uh, which means perhaps I should conclude. Uh, so the, the main thing I want you to take away from this is this idea that when we're thinking about population size considerations, setting aside the case where we get so, so tiny that it becomes itself an endogenous extinction risk, um, if we're thinking about something like 5 billion versus 10 billion, we could think of that as, as bringing forward history, uh, the speed of human history in some sense. Um, and what this means, um, as Toby has pointed out in a very nice paper, is that what's happening at the end of the model is going to matter a lot. So we're going to have to think about these speculative things. Uh, and, you know, I'm confused about the practical implications, uh, but what I feel reasonably confident about is this speeding up history framing is, is going to be a valuable way to make progress on, on thinking through the value of uh, population sizes. And I'll end there. Thank you.